We are in Revelation 12 to 14, very famous part of Scripture, famous part in, in, um, in like religious history, very famous in pop culture, famous in movies, famous in literature. This is, we're going to talk about the woman and the dragon, we're going to talk about uh, the counterfeit trinity, we're going to talk about the mark of the beast. We're going to cover three chapters today. I'm going to try to do it fairly quickly, um, but also in enough depth so that we can actually detail it really well. How does that sound? How are we, how are we going? Okay, we're doing all right. We're doing okay. So um, today I'm going to read Revelation 12. We'll talk a little about it, read Revelation 13, talk about it, 14, talk about it. The reason we've grouped these together is the letter of revealing Jesus, this letter we've been going through, has uh, a bunch of symbols and and signs that point to things of significance. One of the signs that keeps coming up is this number seven or groups of seven. There are actually seven groups of seven in the letter of revealing Jesus in the book of Revelation. We've seen a couple of them where they're very explicit, like the seven seals or the seven trumpets or the letter to the seven churches. So you can see very distinct sevens there. These three chapters also contain a seven. It's one unit, these three chapters. Uh, And each of these sevens, again, remember, these are not future events that are going to take place in a linear chronological um, progression sometime in the future. These are different, these are windows into different parts of the reality of heaven and earth, the reality of the physical world, the reality of the spiritual world, some things that have happened, some things that are happening, some things that will happen. And some of them, some of the the visions kind of mix time all into one, one story. So you can have both all of the Christians of all time, all the people of God of all time, uh, in heaven, while at the same time you have things going on on the earth and you have a, a, se- a sequence of um, plagues that are, that are going out or judgments going out and yet we see them happening all at the same time uh, materially on the earth. And so remember, as we're going through Revelation, this is a book of revealing Jesus. Its primary goal is to reveal Jesus. And I've been really encouraged, even just in myself, but also in uh, hearing feedback from people who are saying things like, I was scared about the book of Revelation before, and now I just have a greater and bigger picture of Jesus, of his majesty and power and might and love and grace to me. And that is the whole goal of this letter. The letter is about revealing Jesus. And so um, let me read for you Revelation 12, and hopefully today will be very clarifying um, spoiler alert, Mark of the Beast, not the vaccine. Just thought we put it out there at the start. Uh, there's a few things that the Mark of the Beast isn't. A couple of things that it possibly is. One thing that it definitely is. So, uh, spoiler alert. All right. A great sign. Remember, we're talking about signs. Everything we see today is going to be a sign, which means that we have to do some interpretive work. So, John is seeing something that a sign that points to significance. Again, we don't go down to um, the Bay in Glenelg and see a sign saying, world's greatest sunset, and look at the sign and marvel over the sign. We need to look up and see what is the sign telling us about so we don't miss the grandeur and the greatness of Jesus. So lots of signs today. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in labor and agony, as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven crowns. His tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. She gave birth to a son, a male who was going to rule all nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to be nourished there for 1,260 days. Remember 1,260 days? Talked about this last week. It's exactly half of seven years. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail. And there was no place for them in heaven any longer. 
So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, or the Satan, your version might say, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say. So again, we are often up until this point where John hears something, then he turns and he sees. Now he is seeing something and then he hears. He hears a voice from heaven. Say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God night and day has been thrown down. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great fury, because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent's presence to her place in the wilderness, where she was nourished for a time, times, and half a time. And again, remember, we know that that also is half of seven years. A time, one year, times, two times, and then a half a time is three and a half years. From his mouth, the serpent swept water like a river flowing after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had spewed from its mouth. So the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and hold firmly to the testimony about Jesus. And the dragon stood on the sand of the sea. So again, remember, we're looking at signs that point to significance. Uh, it's true we can say of the devil, yeah, he's, a, he's a dragon, but is he literally a dragon? Like if he was in person, would he look like a dragon? He would not look like a dragon. This is a sign that points to something significant. And he clarifies who this sign is about in his letter. He says, this sign, the dragon, is the ancient serpent, the one there from the beginning deceiving, the one from the beginning accusing, the devil or the accuser. What about uh, the woman? The woman is a bit debated, actually, who the woman is. John tells us who... The first sign is about, or the second sign is about, but this first sign, the woman. Who is the woman? Um, the woman is the people of God. The woman could be, you could say, representative, uh, could be represented by Eve, from whom all the people of God came, but the woman is the people of God, from whom the one child was to come, and then from whom, from the church, uh, more children come. The, the children of the people of God, the offspring, the church and her offspring are hunted by the accuser who wants to devour them. So from Israel through to the church, represented by this woman. And we know this because it uh, talks about ruling with an iron scepter. We see this is a throwback. You might remember from Revelation 2. Um, this is a throwback, or in fact, a throw forward, as we'll see Jesus um, described in a couple of chapters' time, I think chapter 17. And so we see a picture of the church, picture of Jesus, and a picture of Satan wanting to devour. He's waiting there. And when he can't devour the offspring, uh, when he can't devour the male child, he goes after the rest of the offspring. He goes after the, the whole of the church. The accuser pursues the woman, the church, even to the desert where the church is saved and looked after in exile. The scripture tells us that the accuser is prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. It's the same picture we get here of, it's not a lion in this um, picture, he is a dragon wanting to devour the church. And this passage also shows us our greatest enemy has really three main weapons against us from this passage. That is deception. He's called the deceiver or the accuser. Um, distraction and death. And in fact, we saw even, even in this um, chapter that he does actually not just wage war, but he does succeed in killing many of the church. So deception Distraction and death, the key weapons of the enemy against the church. Uh, but again, thankfully, God has given us tools 
in the fight against the enemy. Uh, Deception really only has power when we agree with that deception. So if we don't agree, if we don't believe when the accuser comes and accuses or the deceiver comes and deceives, if we don't believe, if we continue to trust in Jesus and the rest of these two chapters will show us about the contrast between those who trust in Jesus and those who don't trust in Jesus. And that's why uh, these are all grouped together in this, uh, this group of seven. So when the deceiver says, how could God love you? Of course he doesn't love you. When the deceiver says, he, could, he can forgive those other people their, their sins, but he can't forgive you your sin. Or when he says, ah, oh, this sin's not really that bad. Don't worry about it. You, des- you deserve it. It's not a big deal. Or no one's going to know, or victimless crime, or it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Or when he says, did God really say? Is that really, is that really a thing? That doesn't sound like a loving God. That can't, be, that can't be God. God couldn't have said that. Or the sin isn't such a big deal. Or oh, everybody else struggles with this sin. So, I mean, you know. It's not like I'm the other one out here. Any of those kinds of things, or even just some um, you know, more insidious things like, oh, you'll, you'll never amount to much. You can't really do anything for the kingdom. But how could God use you? All of these lies from the accuser. All of these lies from the deceiver. And a great weapon against his deception is to believe the truth. We'll get into that in the next chapter, I think. And in fact, even uh, Jesus has this time when um, his good mate Peter comes to him and he's saying, man, I've got to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. Uh, this is what I'm here for. And then Peter says, oh, no, may it never be so, Lord. You know, we, that can't happen. And now Jesus responds and says, get behind me, Satan. He's not, trying to, he's not trying to have a go. He's trying to say, you're doing the work of the deceiver. You've listened to the deceiver. We'll look more into this in the next chapter and the one after. God has given us a weapon. We need to use that weapon. For distraction, uh, God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit. And as Paul writes to Timothy about the Holy Spirit, he says, you know, we haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. And so instead of being... Uh, distracted, God has given us himself, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of discipline. And as for death, in the passage it says, they conquered him, that's, that is Satan, the deceiver, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. He might say, well, if one of his three chief weapons against the church is death, how are they then celebrating their deaths? Well, because Jesus has defeated death. So death actually doesn't have any power over those in Christ anymore. So we don't fear death. Not only do we not fear death, so death isn't a thing that looms large over us that's fearful, that if, if we are killed, uh, we've lost and it's done. Uh, it's not even a neutral. Well, God, God in Christ has overcome the power of death. Death is now, it's gain for us. Again, like Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain away from the sinful world, uh, waiting for Jesus to come make all things new. In Hebrews, their writer says, Now since the children of flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear, by the fear of death. So, we, when we are not listening to the lies, not distracted by the distractor, and when we are living in the reality of what Jesus has accomplished in his death, uh, we should be the ones totally unafraid of death. It's a, it's a very hard, very countercultural, uh, very counter, you know, what our flesh will tell us. But it's absolutely true that Jesus has conquered death and there's nothing left to fear in death. And so basically what Jesus has done is rendered Satan powerless against those who are still with the Holy Spirit. He's still raging. 
He is prowling around, seeing who he can deceive when we don't pick up the tools and weapons that God has given us. When we allow ourselves to be distracted, when we allow ourselves to be deceived, when we're like even out of community like this, or we encourage one another and bear one another's burdens and speak life to one another and even call out sin in one another's lives. Uh, these are all weapons that God has given us in the fight against Satan. But he continues to rage. Revelation 13. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. So the devil's standing on the edge of the sea. We saw the edge of the sea last week because there was a giant angel with one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. Totally magnificent creature, this angel. And now we see Satan standing on the sea and he calls up a beast from the sea. It had 10 horns and seven heads. On its horns were 10 crowns. On its head were blasphemous names. The beast I saw was like a leopard, its feet was like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast its power, its, his throne, and great authority. One of its heads appeared to be fatally wounded, but its fatal wound was healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war against it? Remember, these things are signs. We're not looking for some literal beast like behemoth. There's a signs. We'll look at what the signs mean. The beast was given a mouth to utter boasts and blasphemies. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Again, half of seven years. Not the, f- not the fullness of time, um, but an incomplete amount of time. It began to speak blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his dwelling, those who dwell in heaven. And it was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. It was also given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All those who live on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slaughtered. If anyone has ears, let him listen. If anyone is to be taken captive into into captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he'll be killed. This calls for endurance and faithfulness from the saints. Then I saw another beast. Oh my goodness, we've got a dragon. We've got a beast. Now we've got another beast. This beast is coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and compels the earth and those who live on it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. It also performs great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. It deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that it was permitted to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was permitted to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And, make, and it makes everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the beast name or the number of its name. That is the mark. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who is understanding calculate the number of the beast because it is the number of a person. Its number is 666. Very famous themes. Probably recognizing some of these things even as we're reading this chapter of Scripture. Uh, Super, super misunderstood. Lots and lots of uh, people, especially of the futurist camp, uh, trying to go, well, this is the beast, or this person's the beast, or that thing is the beast, or this, you know, all these kinds of things. Let, let me, let us pull this apart a little bit, see what's actually going on here with this dragon, beast from the earth, and beast from the sea. Uh, what's actually at play here, and that'll help us understand what does it mean to have a mark? What does it mean to have this number 666? So firstly, we've got the accuser. What's happening in this chapter is the accuser is setting himself up in the place of God. He has been thrown down to earth and now he is raging and waging war against the people of God and he is setting himself up as God. It's why there was a battle in heaven in the first place. He's setting himself up as God. He's unable to do that in the heavenlies and now that he is exiled to earth, he's trying to do it on earth. But he can't counterfeit God by himself because God is triune. So what does he do? He gets himself a trinity, an unholy trinity. Here we see the counterfeit God 
giving authority to the first beast who is like the counterfeit son, even has a counterfeit resurrection, the son, powerful, miracle working, utters blasphemies. So Jesus tells truths about God. The false son tells falsehoods about God. Oh, I am God. Or the, the dragon is the father. Lies, blasphemies. Then there's a second beast, the counterfeit Holy Spirit. See what it says about the second beast points to the first beast. Like the Holy Spirit points to Jesus. The Holy Spirit calls the world to repentance and to worship of the Son. So does the second beast call the world to worship of the counterfeit Son. It's a counterfeit trinity that we're seeing here. Authority given from the, the, from the accuser to the counterfeit Son and the counterfeit Spirit. We have a counterfeit trinity. The counterfeit Holy Spirit even has a mark. Holy Spirit has a seal with which all of God's people are sealed. The counterfeit Holy Spirit has a seal as well. It has its own mark. And all of these things lead to counterfeit worship. That's the whole idea. The whole world, everyone other than those who were the Holy Spirit, who were deceived by the accuser, are engaged in the worship of the beast. Now, how do we, how are we to understand this? Remember, Revelation, this letter revealing Jesus, is a recapitulation of everything in Scripture that's gone before. In particular, places like Genesis and Job, Zechariah, Isaiah, for example, we've seen, Daniel in particular, we've seen this over and over again, Jeremiah as well. Uh, today, anyone who's familiar with Daniel will th- hear these words of how the first beast is described and say, this sounds just like the beast from Daniel. That's who this guy is. It's a recapitulation. It's another window into who this fourth beast from Daniel 7, same beast in Revelation 13. And what does it say of this beast? Who is this beast? He represents empires that are anti-God. It's like governmental structures and authorities, empires that are anti-God. Remember that this letter was written in a time when the Roman Empire was crushing Christians, hunting them down, brutalizing them, murdering them. To the first readers, they would have identified that beast as Rome. That's how they would have understood it. Symbolically, Rome, not limited to Rome, Rome as a picture of even Babylon, who we saw last week. It's the same city in this Um, revealing language. It's the same city. Babylon is the same city as Rome. It's the same city as all of the empires set up against God even today. It's the same, same beast doing the same work on behalf of the accuser, trying to draw people away from the worship of the true God, getting them to put their trust in them and not in God. Second beast is likely imperial religious authority that points to the first beast. We've seen this happen over and over and over again in in the last 2,000 years where uh, powerful religious authorities give credence to the state and the state's anti-God machinations. See this, I think, in part or a picture of this, even in things in our own day. Things like in America, where we somewhat call America the beast, but asterisk, we might get back to that. Um, we see many people who claim to be Christian giving credence and power to the state. Saw this blatantly. Uh, recently in Russia, where uh, the leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church said to any citizen going off to war, uh, if you participate, your sins will be forgiven. It's disastrous, beastly work. 
I'm not calling these people the beasts. What I'm saying is, these chapters are in here as a warning to us. Because imagine it from, uh, we're seeing this from a, from, an earth, from a heavenly perspective, right? From John's vision, there's a behemoth and Leviathan, these two beasts. There's a dragon like with fire and horns and all kinds of stuff. It looks evil. From an earthly perspective, the nations are deceived. It looks lovely. It looks good. It looks right. It is, it's, from an earthly perspective, it seems like the thing to do to the point where hunting the Christians seems like the right thing to do, which is why, again, Rome is such a picture of the beast. We're so prone to fall for the distraction of the beast and the accuser. Because these idols promise us whatever we want. Give me more power, I'll give you safety. Give me more power, I'll give you, I'll make you great. I'll make you awesome. You wrap up your identity in me and I'll, I'll, I'll become the greatest nation ever or the greatest leader. And because you back me, you will also be great too. Over and over and over and over again throughout history. We see this. And when religious organizations get into bed, and I use that metaphor because the next chapter is going to use the same metaphor, get into bed with government like this, it is disastrous for the people of God. When they say, give me more power, I'll save you, listen to me, or when we've had in our country uh, in the last month, um, government leaders essentially say, well, did God really say? That's not the, that's not the Christianity I know. This is the Christianity I know. False. False, beastly worship. It's not like you're singing to them. That's not what I mean by worship. Worship is what is most weighty and worthy to you. What do you, what do you listen to? Who do you defer to? Who are you obedient to? Whose opinion matters to you most? Whose attention are you trying to trying to get. That's how we can help discern where our worship is going. Who's most worthy of your affection, attention, and obedience? That is who you worship. And what about the 666? It's not 666. It's actually the number 666. Um, And likely, it's again using the symbols that we already know. Three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, meaning half of seven, not meaning exactly halfway to completion or to the end, but meaning incomplete, unable to be the fullness and the wholeness. Or in in the case of uh, the Satan hunting the church is that it's not the end. That's not the end of the story. That's only three and a half. Six being never seven. Looks a bit like seven. Enough to deceive. But it's six, but not just six, it's 666. Three times the six meaning, and again, the three we've seen uh, symbolizes uh, completely. So completely unable to be God. There are some uh, older translations, like in Latin, that would translate this 616, which has led some people to believe that it's actually referring to Caesar Nero, because 666 or 666 uh, in, you know, you line up the Hebrew words, actually gives you the number 666. But if you line it up in Latin, it gives you 616. And in the day, Rome, the beasts of Rome, unless you had the mark, like the, the coin with Nero's face on it, you couldn't actually transact or do any business. Um, even if that was the meaning in its time, symbolically in our time, again, it means uh, in a spiritual sense, that there will be a restriction of Christians participating in the economic marketplace because of our faithfulness to Christ and our inability or unwillingness to capitulate to the world. We see that in the tiniest of senses in the West at the moment, in other parts of the world at the moment, and certainly throughout history, that has absolutely been the case.
What else? Revelation 14. Oh, we've got to be quick. Then I looked. So just like we've seen almost every week, we see here's the state of the world. And even John says at one stage, at one, sense, at one stage, who can stand? Who's going to be able to overcome this? The dragon prowling, devouring, winning, deceiving. Who can stand? And every time the answer comes, those sealed by the Holy Spirit. Every time the answer comes, like in between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, in between the sixth um, seal and the seventh seal, in between the sixth bowl, we're going to see in the seventh bowl, sixth plague and the seventh plague, we always see, man, this is the state of the world. Look at it. It's tough. It's tricky. And it's, it's, it's um, interesting for us in Adelaide in 2022 to preach the Revelation because of all people who have ever existed, we probably have the smallest perspective on what Revelation is talking about out of anyone who's ever existed in terms of persecution, in terms of um, government, in terms of uh, war, in terms of the hardship of life. I'm not saying your life isn't hard. Please don't hear me say that. I'm saying it's easy to be a Christian still in Australia. Then I looked and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Here again the contrast. Those who are with the beast have his mark on their forehead. Those who are with the Lamb have his mark on their forehead. It's not a literal mark, people. It's a sign of belonging. And remember, the 144,000 is all of the people of God through our time. I heard a sound from heaven. So again, he sees first and then he's hearing. It's different. It's kind of inverted. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of a loud thunder. The sound I heard was like harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. But no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So this is a song of the redeemed. Here's a song that only those who are in Christ will know how to sing. Only those sealed with the Holy Spirit will know how to sing. What is he talking about? He's talking about true worship. Only those who are sealed with the Spirit can worship God. And we will. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women since they remained virgins. They're the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from humanity as the first fruits, first fruits for God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. This is how we know this doesn't refer to literal people who have never lied, because there aren't any. You might say, sure, there are people who die virgins. Okay. Uh, but what he's talking about, again, we'll see in a minute, he's, not, he's talking about people who didn't get into bed with the world. Then I saw another angel flying overhead with the eternal gospel to announce the inhabitants of the earth to every nation, tribe, language and people. He spoke with a loud voice, fear God, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So he's saying, you see these beasts coming out from the water and from the earth? Praise the God who made the waters and the earth. We see in Job, uh, the behemoth, from the beast from the earth and Leviathan, the beast from the sea, who are like pets to God. He like has him on a leash. Uh, who's a, Dr. Greg Bill says, like, he puts Leviathan on a leash and takes him walkies. These beasts are not a challenge to God. They are as good as his pets. So praise him, not the beast, not the pets. And another, a second angel followed saying, it has fallen. Babylon the great has fallen. She made all the nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. So again, this sign of Babylon, a sign of Rome, is pointing to the empiric structures, the empires, the worldly structures that are set against God and the people of God. And another third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath which has poured full strength into his cup of anger. 
of his anger. He'll be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There's no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for endurance from the saints who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, this is to John, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they will rest from their labours since their works follow them. And then I looked. So again, hearing and then looking. And there was a white cloud and one like the Son of Man was seated on the cloud with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap, for the time to reap has come since the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Then another angel who also had a sharp sickle came out of that temple in heaven. Yet another angel who had authority over fire came from the altar and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the vineyard of the earth because its grapes have ripened. So the angel swung his sickle at the earth and gathered the grapes from the vineyard of the earth. Then he threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Then the press was trampled outside the city and blood flowed out of the press up to the horse's bridles for about 180 miles. It's a lot of blood. So what's happening here. We have a picture of the lamb again, the slaughtered lamb. And remember from chapter 12, it's by the blood of that lamb that the church has overcome the Satan, the deceiver. And so here we see again this picture, like all of the other seventh trumpets finish with worship in heaven. All of God's people around his throne, worshipping him. This, uh, this last seven brings to an end the prowling of the dragon, brings to an end the rule and reign of the beasts, vindication of the saints sealed with the Holy Spirit, and judgment to those who give credence to idols and not to God. We're seeing the counterfeit worship and now we're seeing true worship. The song of the redeemed. The song only they can learn. Only we can learn. It's true worship. Those who worship false gods and their false seal end up with the same punishment as their false god. Uh, We'll get to in a few weeks. Like uh, I don't want to I'm not glossing over this passage of judgment, but we'll go, we can go into it into more detail in a couple of weeks. But interestingly, how the, in this sign, it shows that the deceiver, Satan, his angels, and the people are judged in the presence of God, not cast out from the presence of God, but actually judged there. And those who join with Babylon into the wine, go into the wine press of God's wrath, showing a massive carnage of death. Like up to a horse's bridle, 180 miles, with this, like these two sickles going out. One from uh, Jesus um, bringing in the harvest, another from the angel bringing in the judgment. It's a big deal. The, I'm, I'm not. Again, I don't want to gloss over these things as if it's not a big deal. Uh, We have this wonderful charge, not just to survive and overcome the deceiver ourselves, but to represent our God in the world and call people into a relationship with him so that they don't end up bearing the same punishment as the ones trying to deceive them. It's a really big deal. Those who are sealed with the Spirit... The saints who endure, it says, they're the ones who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus have eternal life with him. So it's it's also a warning to us not to get distracted, not to to make sure we are bridling our hearts and, and pointing our affections towards the one who has saved us and not letting them be diverted to lesser gods, lest we share their fate. So the goal of these three chapters, not to get you 
postulating or wondering about, well, who's the beast? And what's the number? And is it a microchip or a barcode? Uh, or is it a tattoo? Or is it a vaccine? Uh, it, it is, it's not necessarily any of those things. Let me put it that way. Uh, it's much more a sign that you do not belong to God, just like the indwelling Holy Spirit is the sign on your forehead that you belong to God. So until you see a literal sign on your forehead that says you belong to God as denoting the Holy Spirit indwelling you, we shouldn't be looking for a literal sign on your forehead or chip in your arm uh, to be a mark of the beast. Does this make sense? We need to remember who sits on the throne. No matter what distraction comes away to tempt us away from God, no matter, no matter what deception we hear that tries to make us believe lies about God or who we are in Him, and no matter what economic or physical harm is threatened or even carried out, we remember who's on the throne. That's why John keeps coming back. That's why Jesus keeps giving him these pictures of the state of the world and then the state of the throne. The throne never changes. He's always on the throne. He's always ruling and reigning. Satan is no match for him. Couldn't even beat his other angels, let alone God himself. We do need to be on the lookout for the beast, not so that we can identify him and get fearful about him and make YouTube videos about him, but so that we don't fall for his lies and start worshipping idols. Be on the lookout for a nationalism that distracts us away from Jesus. Look out for a religiosity or, or uh, a religious fervor that distracts us away from Jesus and pours into the empire and not into worship of the Lamb. Is this making sense? Revealing Jesus is about reminding us who God is, who we are in Him, and what the world is like. And again, from an earthly perspective, Babylon or Rome or the world right now may look really appealing to us. Especially with the promises the world's making. But if we just have that gl- keep that glimpse that John has of the same reality in mind, that it is a dragon and two beasts, hopefully our hearts won't be so easily drawn to it. The angel says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. So they will rest in the labours since their works follow them. You know, folks, we have a reward coming for us. Not, not, our, not salvation. Salvation is a gift. We, don't, we can't earn it. It's impossible. You have salvation if you're in Christ. You don't earn it. Don't pay it back. Can't do it. It's, it's done. Sealed. Amazing. But we are rewarded for our works. Those works follow us into our rest. Now that you have your salvation, the message of Revelation 12 to 14 is keep going. Persevere. Even if it costs you your life, man, the rewards are so much greater than just saving our lives for another couple of years. Use the weapons God has given you. Fight back against the accuser. Use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit in you the community of God around you, the picture of heaven above you. You can use all of these weapons in the war against the accuser. And like the first four chapters say, uh, overcome, win. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you uh, that in Christ we have already won and you are making us Winners, overcomers. Not that we uh, would ever try to um, earn our salvation, Father. Just we're so thankful for it, thankful for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. Um, but in our, or and in our current state, Lord, where we know Satan is prowling around, trying to devour, trying to deceive, trying to distract, trying to destroy. Um, Would you help us? Help us uh, to operate in the power of your Holy Spirit. Help help us to live in light of your scriptures, the sword of the Spirit. Help us to 
echo Jesus and say, get behind me, Satan, when we hear those deceptive lies. Help us not be enamored by, uh, by Babylon, by Rome, or by the beasts. And Father, help us to keep our lives, even our lives, in the right perspective, knowing that Jesus has overcome death and to die is gain. Father, we're not, we don't want to be frivolous with our lives. We thank you for them. Um, help us to be effective and fruitful while we still are alive. Uh, but Father, help us to have that perspective that uh, we're going to live forever with you in the new earth. That we're going to be worshipping the lion lamb, pure and spotless, clothed in white robes, with you forever. Please, Father, help us to keep this front of mind even as we are um, going through the mundane of every day so that we wouldn't be distracted, so that our affections would be rightly directed, so that our worship would be rightly ordered. And Father, help us to be effective in being witnesses, like we saw last week, and calling others to repentance and to come into your kingdom. Father, help us to not be, you know, make wild speculations, to get caught up in fear, but to see the revealed Jesus as most glorious overall. And it's in his name we ask. Amen.